Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. Today, we are quickly ending period six. And uh, quickly, I mean, it was only three chapters, but you know, it is what it is, ending period six uh, with chapter 18. So uh, get those brain machines open for some knowledge about to be dropped on you like a little care package from call of duty um all right so chapter 18 the age of the city kind of stems from last chapter uh and really focused more on like urban development in america uh so urbanization Moving to the cities, aptly called the age of the city. All right, so uh, the 1920 census, uh, remember they cut census covers data from 10 years. Uh, and so every 10 years, there's a new census. Um, the 1920 census saw that more people were living in the cities rather than the rural areas. Why? And so, there are a couple reasons. Uh, there are better paying jobs in uh, in the cities, and there is also a boom in entertainment uh, industries in cities, as well as cultural experiences. Uh, new forms of transportation uh, would obviously ultimately lead to cities and ports, um, especially uh, railroads, duh, and ocean liners. Also, uh, the new mechanization of farming uh, will cause uh, farmers to move because there's no more need for a lot of farmers, including young women. So young women will go to the cities. But uh, there's still, this is still, you know, this is following Reconstruction, right? This is more 1880s, 1890s, 1900s. Um, and there are still a few good employment opportunities for African Americans. Uh, but again, we will see this growth in new immigration. It's starred. You need to know it. Need to know it because old immigration, like I said, from like 1820 to 1860, you know, that was from like northern, well, from the from the dawn of American, the American colony. They they came from north and western Europe, and this new immigration, they're going to come primarily during the times 1880 to 1920, uh, and from southern and eastern europe countries like poland italy greece you know we talked about this last time uh and obviously they're going to move to cities because well they they paid most of their most of their life's earnings to come to america so they'll have little little money to buy farming goods in america so they'll move to the cities and the idea of nativism is only going to increase um remember these native born Americans aren't going to like new immigrants coming to America, even though their fam, their ancestors were immigrants. Uh, immigrants had different languages. It was hard for them to unionize. They worked for low wages, mainly unskilled jobs, and um, they're mostly Catholic. And that's two things during this time Americans aren't going to like. They're not going to like immigrants, and they're not going to like Catholics. It's a it's a rough, rough one. So here's a little cartoon of a American man uh, and his family out on the streets, and you have this business owner who's hiring any immigrant they can find. So urbanization. Um, it's this process of assimilation or becoming more American. It was more likely to happen with second generation immigrants to assimilate rather than first generation because cultures and customs are hard to change. And, um, you know, it, it is what it is. It's just tough. Um, but, and a uh, reason this uh, led to assimilation was due to the fact of public schools only, only teaching English or only teaching in English. So they were kind of 
you could say forced to assimilate, but you know, it is what it is. You have the American Protective Association, one of these groups that are anti-immigrant. They are anti-Catholic. They wanted to stop immigration. And then these people will be similar to the Know Nothing Party from the 1840s and 50s. You also have another group called the Immigration Restriction League, and they're going to advocate screenings for immigrants coming to America. And um, a part of this time around, I think it was 1880, 1881, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited Chinese immigration on the West Coast. Um, and here you have a, I think we saw this last time. Um, the, uh, in the last lecture, this same famous uh, political cartoon, the Golden Gate of Liberty, obviously referring to, you know, uh, San Francisco. Um, and so you got this notice, they will it, welcome anyone except a Chinaman. And the Chinaman has all this industry, order, sobriety, peace. All right, so urban landscape. Uh, many parks around this time are going to develop in cities. You have Central Park, who was uh, designed by Frederick Law Olmsted. Uh, there will be social class, social class differences over how parks should be used. Um, the upper class thinking, you know, it should be uh, only allowed for them to go visit and, you know, lower class people who thought, hey, just give me a park, I wanna have some fun. Uh, you have the 1893 World's Fair and it was held in Chicago. And it was, uh, this began the city beautification movement uh, all across the major cities in America. And you have another uh, a book describing this uh, Chicago 1893 World's Fair called The Devil in the White City. And it was written by Eric Larson uh, about a, um, what, ho not homicide, what, a mass murdering doctor in, in the city. Uh, also during this time, kind of kind of stemming from, well, I mean, you, cut, you should kind of already know this from industrial revolution, uh, from uh, world history, but immigrants lived in crowded cities, often in poor, conditions, no running water, okay, uh, no clean sanitation, right? You have these tenement houses, basically apartments, uh, no, became known as slum houses, uh, you know, eight to 12 family members living in a one, two bedroom apartment. Again, no running water. So you have a famous, famous photographer of this time, Jacob Reese, okay, you need to know his name. He photographed the tenement houses in New York City, and he also helped write the novel, How the Other Half Lives, depicting uh, immigrant lives during this time of industrialization and urbanization in American cities. Uh, you also have new forms of transportation. You have the elevated railway, especially in New York City, as well as the Brooklyn Bridge began to be uh, built as well as the beginnings of skyscrapers, obviously made, made possible by steel and the Bessemer process. Remember that? And the first skyscrapers to bless our cities were in Chicago. So Dr. H.H. H. Holmes is the devil in the white city. Here you have Olmsted, slum houses, and um, skyscrapers. So again, stemming from that um, industrial revolution moments uh, are the other sides of urbanization. There are disasters in cities. You know, you have the Chicago and Boston fires in 1871. San Francisco, there's a massive earthquake which will lead to fires across the city. There are diseases running rampant in cities, uh, unsanitary drinking water, no sanitation, no no trash pickup. You, you know, it's gross. A uh, growing number of city residents would be poor. Uh, however, one good solid thing that was happening during this time was the Salvation Army was created, 1879. 
So I think, are these fires? Yeah, this is fire. This is a drawing because these are fires. Fires, fires. Um, so uh, political machines will uh, be at the forefront of politics during this time in Tammany Hall is one of the largest, most famous political machines that you need to know. Um, and what political machines did is they provided jobs and assistance to their constituents, their voters, their electorate, okay? Um, if people couldn't get by, you know, they would go see these political machines, get a loan, they would get their vote, yada, yada, yada. This is obviously depicted in the movie Gangs of New York, Tammany Hall, check it out. Leonardo DiCaprio's in it. Also, you have this idea of graph. There's honest graph and dishonest graph. Uh, honest graph is still, you have this inside scoop of people uh, who, who have the inside scoop on government projects. So the idea is you these people, groups, corporations, businesses buy the land before the government can even make the make the purchase and then you resell it at a higher value. Um, so that's kind of honest graph. And then you have this dishonest graph, which is basically stealing from uh, the federal government. And you have uh, a famous, famous political boss, political machine uh, guy, William Boss Tweed. Uh, and he will steal roughly around $200 million through fraud. Um, he will also, political machines and boss tweed uh, also controlled elections. And, you know, it's at this time where, I mean, I, I, it might be exaggerated in Gangs of New York, but you would have people going around to polling places and voting multiple times. Like, oh, this person went and voted. And then uh, Leonardo DiCaprio would be like, how many times did you vote today? He's like, I've already voted twice. He's all, give him a shave and make him go vote again. You know, it, like shaving their face is going to make them unrecognizable. Um, so a lot of fraud, a lot of corruption are associated with uh, political machines, especially Boss Tweed. Uh, he would also ultimately be captured due to Thomas Nast's political cartoons. Thomas Nast, one of the more famous political cartoonists uh, during this time and across America. So um, here is uh, William, here's Boss Tweed. All right, so mass consumption. Uh, many jobs saw a rise in wages during this time, you know, unions, unions, unions. However, uh, women, African-Americans and Mexicans, Mexican-Americans were largely left out of this. You know, they'd be working in textile industries, paper industries, laundries, et cetera. Um, and they weren't in the, they didn't have the job opportunities as whites did. Um, but key inventions that affected industry, the sewing machine made, uh, now you didn't have to work from home. So women would be out of the home and into factories or stores. And you have the re refrigerated rail car, which is greatly going to help. Uh, farming, the farming industry, so meat does not go stale when it's traveling various miles across America. There's also changes in shopping, and you have the idea of chain and department stores come about. Uh, you have Woolworths, they uh, sold dry goods, department store. And then you have Montgomery Ward, which is no longer in business, and Sears Roebuck catalogs, so Sears. Uh, they also will help farmers um, kind of need to know uh, the catalogs, uh, paper catalogs help farmers get their goods faster. And of course, Macy's department store comes about. And this idea of department stores kind of becomes the norm. So the impact of buying new ways of buying these goods, small businesses, mom and pop shops, would be affected, you know, kind of like when a Walmart or a Target comes into town um, and that's the first one and you have all these department stores, mom and pop shops that, yeah, sure, sell regular goods at higher prices, um, but, you know, they're really like the, the soul of the community and then you get a Walmart, which will just undercut prices and kind of put them out of business. 
Uh, and you also have women advocating for consumer protection and improvement in wages and working conditions. So women, uh, again, are going to voice their concerns, even though they still don't have the right to vote. Um, and so here's a sewing machine. And here's a uh, paper catalog that will be sent homes as advertisements. You probably still see these in your own your own homes um, because that's just the way it was done. And it still happens. So there's some leisure in the consumer economy. Uh, a famous saying during this time is eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, and eight hours for what we will. So leisure becomes more important across America uh, as working conditions improve and people are fine working eight hour days. So you have amusement parks, especially on Coney Island, uh, July 4th hot dog eating competition, anyone? Uh, you have sports, you have baseball. Uh, the first baseball team was the Cincinnati Red Sox or is it <laughs> Red Sox? The Cincinnati Reds, they were also called the Red Stockings initially. Uh, they will win the World Series in 1919 following a uh, betting uh, scandal. Uh, ultimately, the Reds will win. Horse racing and the ideas of the Kentucky Derby come about. And uh, college football with, under the form of the NCAA. You also have movies. Uh, movies come about during this time as well, late 18. 1800s, late 19th century, uh, they would be silent films until about the 1920s. And you have a famous, a famous one, full, full length feature film from D.W. Griffith's, Griffith's The Birth of a Nation. And um, here you have the red stockings. Um, but uh, this picture uh, of the birth of a nation kind of, well, kind of glorifies the KKK. Um, so, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. All right, so, so, uh, so, so, speak with words, Mr. Obey. You have the saloon that comes about, uh, and the saloon is basically like the bar, but you know, it's also a meeting place for working class individuals, and it become an important gathering place for political machines to uh, grow and spread their corruption. And in response to that was. The temperance movement and you know it's the response to saloon and immigrants coming to america and you have uh you know temperance is also like uh slowing down the consumption of alcohol voice crack um you also have the anti-saloon league which hopes to cut down on crime and political machines um and also the growth of newspapers uh under this term yellow journalism which is sensationalized sensationalizing news stories you know not i mean they're over exaggerated right that's another word for sensational sensationalizing um and you have two competing uh newspapers during this time uh under william randolph hearst and his journal and joseph pulitzer's world uh newspapers and this these two would kind of um Yellow journalism is kind of what causes the Spanish-American War. So uh, we'll see that shortly. Uh, here's the famous um, yellow journalism cartoon. Well, Holly G, here's to you. Um, that's just what's associated with yellow journalism. <clears throat> High culture. So there are some important writings that occurred in the age of the city. You have Frank Norris and the octopus, which depicted the relationship between the farmers and the railroads. And as we learned last time, the railroads are really uncut or undercutting farmers. We can't talk about the age of the city without talking about Upton Sinclair, need to know it, need to know it. And he wrote The Jungle and exposed the horrors of a meatpacking industry. Uh, just some good old times uh, that people didn't know what they were eating. It wasn't until this guy who exposed the truths of the meatpacking plants in America. And they, it's going to go, I guess you'd say it's going to go viral uh, because in the same year, the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act were all passed by Congress in 1906, in the same year. You also have the Ashcan School, which is similar to like 
uh, the Rocky Mountain School, the Hudson River School, except this is the artwork that depicted the slums and the grim aspects of modern life. Uh, Darwin's theory of evolution will challenge religion and schools during this time. And it's going to come to a uh, ultimate boil uh, during the Scopes Monkey Trial in the 1920s. You also have this idea of pragmatism where ideas were to be tested, not just solely based on theory. And if it's a theory, it's understood and no one's going to question it. Pragmatism, the pragmatism movement, pragmatism thought is like, well, let's test it and see if it stands the, the test of time. And if it doesn't, well, then it's not a good idea. So uh, some more high culture. You have in education under uh, John Dewey. Uh, he hoped to change education where there would be a less reliance on memorization and more on acquiring knowledge through experience. Um, and there would also be a growth of education across America where there would be an increase in free, uh, in free primary and secondary education. Um, still rural areas lag behind because, you know, distances and transportation. You have the moral land grant, um, which land would be set aside to the states by the federal government for colleges. Uh, still higher education opportunities for women at this time were limited uh, and some institutions would create separate female schools. Uh, if you remember, Forrest Gump, Jenny goes to a female college, and that's in the that's in supposed to be in the 1950s or 60s, right? Okay, all right. That's John Dewey on the left. That's Moral on the right, and that concludes this lecture. So um, a lot of stuff, not as not as heavily. Uh, not as heavily written with notes, um, but there are some ideas that are very important to American history. So hopefully you did learn some, some new aspects. Uh, like I said last time, this is ideally when your growth, your, your depth of American history from eighth grade kind of stops and it kind of starts now. So, um, if these are new ideas to you, make sure you know them. Um, if you can put them into your memory banks, that's awesome. You'll need it for the A push exam. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, that concludes it. Uh, get ready for your uh, period six exam. And uh, if you did like this lecture, make sure you smash that like button for your good old history teacher trying to become, you know, a monetized YouTuber. Doubt that's gonna happen. Um, but as always, stay safe, wash your hands, peace.